I am so delighted to welcome Heidi Roizen uh, to Network Capital. I've heard about her from many of my friends who've gone on to build incredible companies and my, uh, my PhD supervisor, Mark Mintreska, and many other professors at Oxford. Heidi, you've had such an incredible career. Thank you very much uh, for taking time out for us. Today's conversation is an open-ended exploration uh, about your career, the principles that uh, have uh, made you who you are today, and a bit about your values and advice to younger people. Fantastic. Well, I'm so excited to be here and I'm excited, you know, I, I will be visiting you in Oxford in the fall and I'm so excited to be coming there live. So this is, it's great to have a, a preview conversation. So Heidi, tell me about your foundational years. Um, everyone knows your background. It is stellar, but tell me about growing up. How were mom and dad like? What was the, uh, what was the household like? Well, I had a, I had a, um, in, in, I, in some ways, a very fortunate upbringing, and in some ways, a, a you know a, some challenges. Um, but my parents were both immigrants. Uh, my dad originally uh, from Moldova, and my mother from Germany. And um, they came to the United States looking for a better life. And my dad was a very entrepreneurial person, um, an engineer, and he ultimately ended up here in Silicon Valley. And he told me once when I was quite young, he said. Honey, you don't have to move anywhere when you grow up because I've looked the whole world over and this is the best place to be. So my my parents very much chose this place. And you have to remember, my dad worked here in the late 50s and early 60s. So it was not the Silicon Valley we knew to, uh, today, but it was still a, a place of technology and creativity and education. You know, obviously with Stanford and Berkeley here, uh, my dad worked for a company called Ampex, which was a pioneer in the video tape recording amongst other um, technical industries related to audio and video. Um, the, the flip side is that my, my mom only had an eighth grade education. My parents got divorced. My mom was really unable to, to have any jobs other than minimum wage jobs. We went through a lot of financial difficulties and that Im imprinted on me the importance of getting an education and being able to pursue work and do something more because watching my mom go through, you know, really a very difficult adult life because she lacked the education um, and the, you know, the background to get a, a better job was very impactful to me as well. So those, those two things pretty much shaped me. And, and then the final point is, I, I have to say, I was definitely in the right place at the right time, you know, to, to be at Stanford in 1976 through 1980 as was your advisor, Mark, who was a classmate of mine. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, to, to be here in, in 1976 and 1980, you've got the personal computer revolution going on. You've got the homebrew computer club meeting at Stanford. You've, you've got all these computer companies, most of which aren't around anymore, you know, starting the, the personal computer revolution. It was a really amazing time to be here. So I yeah. my dad was right, I guess I would say. <laughs> um, so you chose uh, language, English literature, language, because you were very interested uh, in, in, in the subject at Stanford. What guided you through the process? And do you regret not sub studying something very technical? Yeah, that's a, that's, a great, that's a great and loaded question. Yeah, I majored in, believe it or not, creative writing, because even though I just told you the story about how my mother couldn't uh, get a job and I decided to do something that was very employable. For some reason, I picked creative writing and I worked at the Stanford Daily and I, I picked that route because I guess I believed at the time that you could make a living as a writer. And obviously many people do. So I'm not hmm. maligning the industry of journalists and, and uh, creative writers and authors. I don't think I would have been one of them. And when I graduated, I needed a job and looking in the newspaper, as one did at the time, there were not a lot of jobs saying, mm. we really need a creative writing major here. So interestingly, <laughs> I did find a job as the editor of the company newspaper for a computer company, a company called Tandem Computers, which was an early uh, entrant into um, the, sort I guess I would call it now the mini computer space with a redundant computer for, for fail-safe applications. And 
I was hired there to be the editor of the company newspaper. And uh, because that wasn't a full-time job, I was also responsible for teaching entry-level classes to people on how to use word processing, how to use a email, how to use the database, kind of the early, you know, again, remember this is 1980. Hmm. So all of that was quite new and not as, as um, uh, <laughs> proliferated as it is right now. And what I realized as I was doing that job, it was an incredible job in many ways because I had access to the whole senior leadership team and I was in right. frequent contact with them. And I was reporting on all the events that the company was doing, new offices, new products, uh, new hires, that sort of thing. And what I realized is everyone who was doing the interesting work was either an MBA or an engineer. Right. And I was neither. And so I decided that it would be really hard to go back and get an engineering degree, but I thought perhaps I could go back and get an MBA. And so that's what I did. I, I left and, and went to Stanford Business School. We're going to come and talk about your time at Stanford. Uh, but on Network Capital, we're very interested in learning about our first thousand dollars. Do you want to tell our listeners, how did you earn your first thousand dollars? Well, this is this is you're going to laugh. Um, my first thousand dollars came well before I went to college because I was a professional puppeteer from age uh, 12 to probably age 19 or 20. I had uh, some family members of mine had gifted me a few puppets when I was a child, Steiff puppets, for those of you who know the, the brand, a German brand. My mother's family was many were still in Germany. And they had sent me a few. And over the years, I had built up, you know, a collection of maybe nine or 10 of them. And when I was 12 years old and we didn't have a lot of money, I came up with the idea that maybe I would do puppet shows for children's birthday parties. I charged um, $5 and I advertised in the local newspaper and I would show up. My mother would have to drive me to the shows and I would show up and I was mistaken for one of the guests early on but I ended up building it into quite a business and by the time I was in high school later in high school I was usually doing six shows per weekend and I was by then charging $30 a show and so there were months I was making over a thousand dollars a month doing puppet shows which is funny because my first job at Tandem paid a thousand dollars a month and so I remember thinking, I just went to Stanford for four years and I'm making the same amount of money I was making as a <laughs> year in high school. <laughs> so entrepreneurship hence, was very hence clearly- Hence the MBA, hence the need hence, to- Hence the MBA, <laughs> yeah. But this was fascinating. When I, when, I, uh, when I learned how you made your first thousand dollars, I was like, wow, the entrepreneurial DNA was very much in you from the beginning. You knew, I think you had a sense of always carving out your career, carving out your niche, and you did. Uh, Warren, even at Warren Buffett, by the way, has an amazing uh, theory, an interesting theory about you can judge how entrepreneurial a person is and in many ways how successful they'll be in, in business leadership by at what age did they start earning money and how entrepreneurial was the, was the thing they did. And obviously for most people, if you start earning money before you're 16, at least in America, you probably had to do something entrepreneurial because it's very, you you know, most labor laws don't let you get typical jobs. Right. Yeah, yeah. And you did. Um, so Tandem, you, you started feeling that uh, you're doing something interesting, but you want to be at the forefront of technology. You decide to go to the Stanford Business School, a top, top business school at the time, still is. Uh, what was GSB like? Um, what did you learn and how did you decide to take your entrepreneurial bug to the next level? So I, I think that, you know, the GSB was an interesting place then and remains an interesting place now. I, I still go lecture there fairly frequently. Yeah. I, I love the place. The students are amazing. It's 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 one thing I'll, I'll say about Stanford, and I hope the same is true when I get to Oxford. I'm sure it is, but they do a really good job picking students. And so if you get to have the, the fun opportunity to teach somewhere like Stanford, and, you know, I lecture at both the GSB and I'm an adjunct now in the engineering school, the the students you meet are, are truly, truly, truly amazing people. And so it's just a gift and a joy to be able to be over there. Mm. So when I was there, again, 1981 to 1983, it was a little bit of a different place than it is today. Today, 
everyone wants to be an entrepreneur. Back then, everyone wanted to go to Wall Street. So if you saw Wolf of Wall Street, that's about the era that I was there. And everyone wanted to be investment bankers and management consultants. And I will admit, when I got to business school, I did not know what an investment banker or a management consultant even was. Mm. And so, um, so in some ways, I got there and it was uh, not what I expected. However, met really interesting people. I learned a lot about the basics of business, the basic language of business, cost accounting, financial accounting, uh, operations management, uh, power and politics and organizations, which is funny, of course, because the case that Harvard has about me is is now taught everywhere about about the, that topic, right? Building business. My network. defil is a lot about, you know, that. Uh, the, yeah. The, so the so anyway, we'll, 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 put a pin, we'll put a pin in that for later. But um, but the point is, there was a lot to learn at business school um, about the basics, because I pretty much didn't know any of even the most basics, right? Even for me, cost accounting and financial accounting were eye-opening. I guess to say that shows you how remedial uh, my uh, my efforts were there. But long story short, I what I what I learned when I went there, as I think we often learn in places, you aspire to go somewhere you're somewhere you're really worried that everyone's going to be better than you, and then you get there and you're like, hey, I'm actually okay. Like they're not smarter than I am or whatever. I I applied for jobs. No one would hire me because I didn't have a technical background. And then I once again lucked out because of family. My brother, who went to Berkeley and majored in math at the time, because there was no such thing as a computer science major, hmm. was a computer scientist. And he was working at the World Bank. And he had invented a product at the World Bank because he says he was lazy and he kept being asked to do work that is really the precursor to the spreadsheet, right? Crunching numbers. And they were the, they were different numbers, but the same formula and formulae, formulas, however you say it. And, mm. uh, and, and so he designed a program to do the same things with new data. It was a very early spreadsheet and the world bank was not interested in it. So he asked them if he could continue to develop it on the side on his own. And they said, fine, do what you want. And so he bought a personal computer and he worked on that. And again, this was before, before the IBM PC. It was right around mm. the launch of the IBM PC. Uh, and, uh, and I got really excited about what he was doing because to me, the personal computer was, was really, well, let me take a step back. The first time I used a word processor, which was probably my senior year at Stanford and maybe around when I first joined Tandem, right? it was a magical experience. If you have just gotten an English creative writing degree, you have spent a lot of time at a typewriter and you have spent a lot of time with whiteout and retyping whole things is terrible. And the idea that you could put your words into this ethereal thing and work on them and massage them and change things around. I, I tell people this now because they say, I know it's hard for you to imagine what it would have been like to be a writer in the era pre-word processor. It was magical for me. And it, and, and it really gave me this incredible religion about the idea that if you could bring computing power to non-technical people, you could unlock a lot of creativity, a lot of productivity, a lot of power. And I was very excited about that. So my brother's program did the same thing for numbers that the word processor mm. for words. And this was before VisiCalc or any of these other things were on the market. It, it was really up around right the same time frame as, as VisiCalc was being introduced to the world as well. So it was very exciting to me. And, and I was more excited about that than I was about getting a job. Plus nobody hired me. So, <laughs> so my brother and I decided to go into business together and, and launch this company called TeamMaker, which had as its initial product, this, this spreadsheet. How did you decide to, how did your brother and you decide that you would be the CEO? <laughs> Another funny story. He, um, he was based in Washington, D.C. He still had a full-time job. That was part of how we were able to afford to do this. He had a full-time job. He had been selling this in this little sort of software reseller online. 
And so he was making a little bit of revenue from it. And he agreed that he would sort of let me have the revenue in order so that I didn't have to get a job. And he would keep working at the World Bank. And I was talking to the the head of uh, corporate communications at Tandem about how I was going to not come back to Tandem and instead I was going to start this company. And she said, well, what role, what's your role? And I said, I don't know, I guess I'll call myself VP of marketing or something. And she said, well, that's silly. You should be the CEO. Mm. And I said, why? And she said, because it's a tiny little company. You have no marketing budget and you're a woman and there are no women in technology. You will instantly be a story. You will, you will punch above your weight in terms of public presence because you're a woman. Also, p- customers want to talk to the highest ranking person. They want to talk to the CEO. And your brother doesn't want to do that. He just wants to code, right? He, he, and that's mm. part of why my brother hired me, right? Is he didn't want to do all that stuff. He wanted to right. work on the product. And so I thought that was a very rational argument. And I went and told my brother this. And my brother, being an extremely rational programmer, said, you know, she's right. You can be the CEO. So that's how I ended up as CEO. And you spent a lot of time building it, scaling the company, um, what what was it, what was it like? Because uh, what were some of the important inflection points in taking the company to the next level? Well, I think what I'm going to say resonates with all entrepreneurs even today, and it's one of the reasons why I'm so lucky to still be doing this job and working with entrepreneurs. You know, forty forty some years later, is because the entrepreneurial journey hasn't changed much, right? The mm. technologies change, the the modes of marketing change, all that. But it is you. When you're the entrepreneur, you are living or dying by whatever it is you can accomplish, plus luck, plus you know the overcoming of obstacles. There, there's a lot of randomness that occurs. But one thing I think is is true is. Entrepreneurs who are in it with only one foot are probably not going to get very far because your company will face life or death situations on a monthly, weekly, perhaps daily basis when you're in the startup world. And you you just, it, it it's the same is true today. I, I can tell you a story from our first year in business. Our first year in business, we had this very big bill that was due from a software distributor based in Maine. And we heard a rumor that they were going to go bankrupt and they weren't going to pay. And and it was, a, I think it was like a, an $80,000 bill, which again, our, our revenues in the first year were 600,000 maybe for our first mm. full year of, of, of business. So 80,000 was a pretty significant piece of you know, piece of of money. By the way, we we bootstrapped the company for the first six years. We did not raise venture capital. So we were living hand to mouth on our revenue. And I heard that they were maybe not going to pay us. And so I bought a the cheapest ticket in the world to fly to Maine. And I rented a car and I drove to this place because it was in the middle of nowhere. I don't remember why it was in this crazy place. And I wore like a business suit, which cracks me up to this day. And I carried a briefcase. Don't ask me why I carried a briefcase. I don't, (laughs) but I decided I was going to look severe and professional. Now, mind you, I was 25, maybe 26 years old. So I don't know how severe and professional I looked, but I, I walked in and I asked to see the CEO and I said, I am not leaving the lobby until I see the person and get my check. And I sat there and he finally came out and he paid me in it with a check which I ran and cashed. <laughs> <laughs> and about three months later, they did in fact go under. And so I luckily I had been paid before the window where you have to give the money back. In right, right. See? But anyway, whatever that window was, I had, I had made the cutoff, but that was the difference between the company staying in business and not staying in business was, you know, I, I, I can't tell you how many times I remember thinking, you know, you have this moment where you feel like, oh, I just, I can't do it anymore. I'm going to give up. This is too hard. I don't know how to fix this. And then it's usually at like two in the morning because you're, you've been up till then trying to figure out how, how to solve the problem. And you get this 
you know, piece of steel in your backbone that straightens up and you say, I am not going to let this, I am not going to fail because of this. I am not going to let this bring me down. And then, you know, luckily for me, I, we managed to continue to run the company and grow it. And we had many more near death experiences and ultimately, you know, sold the company. Let's see, we founded it in really 82 while I was still in business school and, and sold it in 94. So 12 years um, until we sold the company. But that that entrepreneurial journey has not changed at all in my at all. You yeah. have to. Uh, I'm paraphrasing somebody, but uh, they said that entrepreneurship is going from setback to setback uh, with enthusiasm. I think it's Brian Armstrong from Coinbase. Yes, and that is it. It's just you know the high the you never have higher highs or lower lows in any career. I think as you do when you're an entrepreneur. <laughs> True, true. Um, Heidi, in the journey, 12-year journey of running the company with your brother, hiring loads of people, um, scaling it, selling it, uh, what was the co-founder relationship like? Um, what were the relationship dynamics like with your employees? Can you give us a flavor of that? Sure. And uh, and I think, as you know, I have a podcast called The Startup Solution, and I did an episode, um, what is it called? The Case of the Nepo Nightmare which was not about my own brother. Uh, it was about a different situation, but I do talk in there about what it's like to run business with family. And so if you want the the full guts of it, you can listen to that episode. But in short- We're gonna link that in the show notes. Heidi. Okay, great. Um, look, I, I love my brother. My brother is fantastic. He's a brilliant programmer. I, I never would have the career I have without him. And so I am eternally grateful to him. But running- companies together as family is a challenge. And, and I think that the, you know, having reflected on it for the podcast, one of the things that I think I now bring up to other people doing it is there is a pre-existing relationship and a pre-existing power dynamic in family relationships. And you bring that to the company. And that doesn't necessarily work well for a company because there are there are protocols, there are chains of authority, there should be decision-making authority that falls to your work line, not to your familial line, but the, but, the, but the family relationship is very hard to supersede. And so I definitely, there were times my brother didn't like decisions I made and he wanted to make different decisions. And one time I went on vacation for a few days and he fired you know, two of the five people I had hired. And, um, and he really wanted us, we, we had a different, we had different motivation for starting the company. He started the company to manifest the product that he invented. And I, once I started the company, I had started a company to bring personal computing to Matt, to normal people. Mm. And that included other people's products, not just my brother's. I couldn't just build the whole business on only what my brother was going to program and so that created a fundamental rift between us, which I think, you know, ultimately we decided to split the company up and he took back his original product and worked on successive products as, as a sort of a, almost like an individual contributor selling directly to, cons to the consumers mm -hmm. who liked his product. And I went on and, and, you know, dove quite heavily into the Macintosh market, which was, again, the Mac was introduced in 1984. So that was a, you know, that was something that was nascent at the time. And my brother didn't even like Max. He said, these are toy computers. They have no power. <laughs> um, they, they're, 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 they're junky. And so, <laughs> which they sort of were at the time compared to an IBM PC, which was, right. you know, which probably same about the same uh, time. I think 1982 was the PC. So it, it, it taught me a lot. It was hard for both of us to go through that period. I'm happy to say we did get through it and we remain extremely close. And uh, so that's good. We didn't destroy our family, but the, the dynamic was challenging. And I do, uh, I do counsel people. If you're going to work with family, you have to make a pact that when you're, when you're in the work mode, the family relationship has to get, has to take the back seat. And right. so- you have to uh, you have to to honor the reporting structure and the decision making structure. You have to not communicate things that you know. You have to ask yourself if this weren't my 
brother, sister, mother, wife, husband, would I be telling them this information? And if the answer is no, you have to, you have to adhere to that. And that can be very hard, especially if both people decide they don't want to play by the rules. Yeah, I can imagine, but it's super helpful. We're going to link this, this show. Right? I just wanted to share that um, we did a podcast called Couples uh, That Work. There are uh, there's mm-hmm. an INSEAD professor who talks about the relational dynamics between two people who work. And there is a segment within that where couples who decide to start companies together, they have actually very similar things that they should keep in mind, the one that you and your brother went through. Some of them manage to maintain the relationship, even if they see the uh, the direction of the company going in different way. Sometimes it atti- entire thing flounders. Yep. So... I thought that this uh, aspect of a very successful exit from uh, from your aspect was a key highlight. Uh, I reckon. Yeah, no, and it and it was, and it was very challenging, and and it was, and I think it was, it was unusual in a way because my brother had a very unusual attitude about the company. So even though he was the biggest shareholder, I was the second biggest shareholder. He did not consider any of the revenue or profit we derived from the Mac products to be attributed to him because he said, I didn't even want to go into that business. So interestingly, he said, you can buy me out with revenue from the product line that I didn't create. And Mm -hmm. when you think about that, I mean, honestly, he was a shareholder in the whole entity. So he already was entitled to because again, we had no venture at the time. So it was basically just us and a, and a few employees who had small positions. He he could have just said, well, it's mine and these revenues are mine, but he didn't push his, basically his, his, his rights mm-hmm. as a shareholder. And he said, you did that, not me. And so we came up with a price and I, I was able to pay him out of the proceeds of the company, which... Mm-hmm. Which was highly unusual, right? That is that is not, and and you know, to this day, I I tell him, I go, that was a really amazing thing you did. And in his own opinion, he's like, well, I, you know, I don't think it's amazing because you, those were yours, those were not mine. But uh, he's a great guy. <laughs> I'm very lucky, a lucky sister. <laughs> Thank you for sharing, Heidi. This is so important for you know people at different stages because uh, our listeners our entrepreneurs, investors, all the young professional students, they will experience it at some point. Mm-hmm. A useful mental model for that. I reckon you had a good exit, a really good exit at the time. Like, you know, you- um... It was a good exit. It wasn't a great exit, but it was a good exit. It was certainly, you know, for me, it was a life-changing amount of capital. Um, <laughs> you know, it's always interesting how that number seems to keep going up and up and up, <laughs> what it really means, but- yeah, no, I was I was very great. It was a long time coming, right? It was twelve years in the making, but uh, but I was very happy happy with the outcome. So, one aspect of your career is done. You've built your company, you've sold it. Um, so, did you feel that uh, I can rest now? I can relax. I can you know choose mm-hmm. to do something different, or did you? How did you think of your career transition at the time? Well, I think, and again, I think this is very typical of the entrepreneurial journey. Journey. You do it for a long time. You get tired. You also get worried that, you know, many companies, many companies and many venture back companies, they have an arc. They go like this and then they ultimately go like this. Many things grow and die right in in the world and companies are not that different. And it's one of the things we talk about in venture a lot of times, since after all, we are managing investments and you have to know when the right time to get liquidity is. Mm. And my feeling about my our company at the time was we did a lot in we had made this big business out of something called click art which was basically digital clip art and that was fine when the only way people could get stuff was buy it on diskettes which is our cd roms which was how we distributed software at the time but when the internet loomed and remember this was 1993 1994 so when you think about that, I mean, Netscape IPO was 1997, I think. So many hmm. years before the internet was a mainstream concept, Right. Um, I certainly saw the handwriting on the wall. And I thought, well, when all computers are connected and people can just swap files, nobody's going to care about copyright. They're just going to start swapping files and we're not going to have a business anymore. 
And so we had we had created a product for online ordering of printed products in collaboration with a company called Deluxe, which was um, the nation's largest check printing company in America. So there you go. They they printed a lot of checks and they were worried checks were going to go away. And they, want, they had all these printing presses. And so they wanted to do business cards and letterhead and envelopes and things they thought maybe weren't going to go away for a while. So we created a way for them to do this with a dial-up modem. You know, this is, again, all pre-internet. And uh, they liked the product so much that they decided they wanted to buy the company. And I was ready to sell then because, well, because I wasn't sure that I wasn't sure what we were going to do next that was going to allow us to continue and grow and be profitable when our main product lines were things that I was concerned were, were going to be basically obliterated by the rise of the internet. And so uh, plus I'd gotten married. I had a one-year-old child. I, you know, there is also a point I've been doing it for 12 years that you kind of say, I need a break. So of course, when you sell companies, and most entrepreneurs will discover this, it's not like they just say, bye, hand us the keys. They want you to actually run the thing they acquired. And I ran the thing for another year, year and a half. And that was hard because you're used to calling the shots. You're used to making the financial decisions. You're used to that. And then all of a sudden you have a boss and the boss says, well... And they were a very traditional company. They were based in mm. Minneapolis. They were a hundred year old company. And I would say something like, we want to launch a new software product. And they said, well, let's test market it in Des Moines for six months. And I said, well, <laughs> that's not how software works. That's not how you do this. And so it was very frustrating. Plus the person who had been our champion and had acquired the company, a wonderful man, um, named Arnold Angeloni had had been in line for the CEO, you know, the, the CEO left and he had been one of the potential contenders, but for whatever reason, he didn't end up getting the job. And so he left the company. And so our internal champion was gone, which is another thing. Again, entrepreneurs <laughs> learn, you sell your company, you sell it because someone inside the acquirer is passionate and really going to, going to do stuff for you. And then I call it clash of the Titans stuff happens up there on Mount Olympus that you don't know about. And all of a sudden you've been deprioritized. Mm. And so ultimately I just decided it was time for me to leave. I stayed through my contractual obligation, but I decided it was time to leave. But of course, another thing is really hard to do is leaving the company you founded. You've hired every single person, you know, them, you know, their children, you know, their you know, you know, which cars is there are theirs in the parking lot. I mean, you get to know these people incredibly, incredibly well. And it felt like a betrayal to leave. And so the the interesting thing that happened then is I, I got an offer from Apple and we had been a a one of the first developers for the Mac. As I said, we we did this right. product card. It was the fifth product to ship for the Mac. So imagine a Mac is launched and there's only like you go buy a Mac, there's not very much you can buy to go with it. And so <laughs> we were one of the very, very early Macintosh products. And so I had become a big proponent of the Mac. I'd become a critic of Apple in the in the in the true sense of the word critic. I was not always critical. I was just I as I used to say to Apple employees, you know, I live or die more by the, by your decisions than you do. Because mm. I've bet my whole company on the Mac and my company will literally go out of business if you guys do things differently where you like, you probably will still have your jobs depending on what decisions you make. And so I had also made a name for myself in the software industry. I had become the president of the Software Publishers Association, which was the industry trade group at the time now known as the SIIA, something like that. Hmm. Um, anyway, it's still around. It's just got a broader name. It encompasses more now. So, so I was, I was fairly well known in the, in the software community. And so Apple at the time was going through a very challenging time period and they had a group called developer relations, which if you guys have heard of the infamous guy, Kawasaki, that was something he started, right? Evangelism. Mm. And they needed someone, they needed a new VP to lead wide, worldwide developer relations. And so they recruited me for that job. And so in a way it was the perfect way to also leave my company because I wasn't really leaving. I was just going to the mothership to try to convince them to be better to developers like our company. And right. so that felt like the right thing to do. 
And what was that like? Uh, what were working with some senior leaders at Apple? Teach you? <laughs> well, you, if you want to have me back for five more episodes and bring along, <laughs> just, I can probably talk about it. But in summary, you know, it's a, at the end of the day, it was a big corporate job. There was a lot of infighting. The company was in a free fall. People don't remember, you know, that Apple almost went bankrupt. The, the, the quarter I joined, they lost $700 million. And what people also don't remember is if Microsoft hadn't lent them, I think it was 250 million the following year, they would have gone under. And so it's really a tremendous story. I don't know why, I don't think it's been covered sufficiently as it should be because now of course, Apple and Microsoft are two of the largest market cap companies in the world and trade places once in a while. And it's interesting to think that Microsoft saved Apple. And so, um, you know, long story short, I was there it was a company in crisis. I There was a lot of internal infighting. The leadership was the wrong leadership for the company. This was right before mm. they brought Steve Jobs back or Steve Jobs took it over, however you want to, <laughs> however you want to say that. And um, at the, and I had a, at that point, I had a one-year-old and a three-year-old. I was never seeing my kids. I was, I was, I still brought my entrepreneurial work ethic to a large company, but it didn't scale. I was, I was still too hands-on. I had th 300 people in my group and I was, you know, I was just working constantly and I had a global organization. And so I used to say, you know, the sun never sets on a, on, on the problems I'm uniquely supposed to solve. <laughs> you know, I get up in the morning, and I get a thousand emails a day and they were all, nobody was having a good time at that time. So I did, I told myself I'd give it a year and I, and I gave it a year and then I decided that the big corporate life was not for me. And also a place that was that was in the kind of crisis and transition that Apple was in. You know, when you're responsible for developer relations, you're spending all your time, you know, you think about it at the time, Apple was about 12 billion a year in revenue. And hmm. the developer community was probably another 12 billion a year in revenue. You know, you just think about your own expenditures. Even today, when you think about how much you spend for the hardware and then how much you spend for the software, it's about 50-50, right? It's, 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 it's usually about the same. And so there was a $12 billion a year industry that I was trying to keep on our platform while at the same time, our sales were dropping by 25% a year. And at that point, we only had 3% market share, Apple did. And so, and we demanded because of the way the Apple closed environment, open, closed system versus open system work that you develop your software on our platform, not that you port it over, which had many benefits, right? For anyone who uses a Mac and you know, in the early days, the fact that the commands were all the same across applications was incredibly innovative, right? right. I mean, that was just something that, that had been, uh, you know, that had been uh, uh, put forth by Apple in a way that no one had really ever done before on on these platforms. And so, long story short, um, I uh, it was a really hard job, and the leadership was hard. And then we bought Next, and even though I had great, tremendous respect for Steve Jobs, and 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 I and I thought, frankly, he would be a very good leader of Apple the pain we were gonna go through because the next operating system didn't run on the installed base of 25 million Macintoshes, right? It was, it was not, it was not, it was gonna be the new direction. And I was supposed to be convincing the developer base that they were supposed to stay true to our platform when our platform was in a free fall. And then just personally, I was tired. You know, I had made money from the sale of the company. So I had the, the luxury of the resources to decide not to work for a while. And I just decided I just didn't want to do it anymore. So I stopped for a while. <laughs> I, I research and study, right, about career transitions uh, extensively. So you, you, Reed Hoffman, and a few other people I've heard talk about tours of duty. Mm -hmm. So how did you shape your next tour of duty? And why is this concept a useful one for young professionals and executives to look at? Well, I think this is, again, it's a huge topic, but I would, I would say, if I were to summarize it is, life is not a fixed experience through your entire life, right? You have different priorities, you have different skill sets, you have different levels of energy, you have different desires for how your personal life works as you progress. And at any point in your life, it's important, I think, to step back and consider 
what is what is it? What do I what am I doing with with my work life? Because for most of us, your work life is the principal way you spend your waking hours. And so you mm. may as well make it good and useful and something that feeds that feeds you not only financially, but feeds your your sense of curiosity, feeds your soul in terms of what you're doing, hopefully to to um, contribute to society or contribute to the world in some way. And lifestyle. You know, I, I, I joke, I joke with some of my partners right now that I have a lot more free time. I remember I was talking to one of my partners in the, um, we were in the lunchroom and she had a cold and she was dragging herself through the day. She had a, you know, a six-year-old and the eight-year-old. And I said, what are you doing this weekend? She goes, oh, I'm sick, but I've got, I've got this event. I've got that event. And -and so-and-so has a dance recital and -and so-and-so has a soccer game. And I got to go to this PTA thing. And I said, you know what I got to do? I got to open three cans of dog food between now and Monday. Um, (laughs) so, so my life changed, right? My kids were grown. I'm divorced. I'm single. I can devote different levels of time even now than I could at a different point in my life, different priorities. Mm -hmm. And so I think of my, my team maker days and, and I'm so glad I did it. But I think that, as I said, the, the, the job of an entrepreneur is very hard. I think it is very, it is, it is the top priority in your life. I'm not saying you can't be an entrepreneur who's also married and has children. And I know people who do it, but for me, it was very hard to do. For me, it was very hard to try to balance those priorities. And I see people do it and I'm amazed at those people. Everyone's different. So that's part of why everyone's tour of duty looks different. You can't prescribe to someone else what their tour of duty looks like. But for me, I just needed, I needed to take a break. I also decided the corporate world was not for me because it was a lot of infighting. It didn't feel like you were moving any ball forward. You were internal. And I'm sure it was just Apple at the time was part of the problem. It was global and it was crisis driven, especially when you're near the top, right? You're dealing with the crises. And not that I was near the top. I was one of probably 40 VPs. It's not like I was running Apple or anything, but, but I was responsible for the developer community and they were in crisis. And so I just, at the end of that, I said, you know, I don't really want to do that. I really love the entrepreneur entrepreneurial journey, but I don't want to be an entrepreneur. So what can I do? And so as luck would have it, one of the very first calls I got was from a gentleman named Doug Burgum, who was the CEO of Great Plains Software. And I had gotten to know Doug over the years. He had gone to Stanford a few years before me and, and he was part of the Software Publishers Association. I used his software at my company. So we were, I think we were his biggest Macintosh user. Um, mm-hmm. And Doug, who is currently rather famous right now because he might be Trump's pick for vice president, which is <laughs> the world is a strange place. I'll just leave it at that. Um, but anyway, Doug called me and he said, I want to take my company public. I want to strengthen the board. And I want to be sure I, I also have more gender diversity on my board, which by the way, was extremely rare in 1997. And so he offered me a board seat. So I joined his board and I thought, well, this is a really cool way to to work on entrepreneurship because Mm. I can help. I can bring everything I've learned to the table. I can be on a team. I can be solving interesting problems. I can be working directly with senior leadership. But at the end of the day, I get to go home. (laughs) And the crises are not my, you know, once in a while a board has a crisis, right? Once in a while it comes to the board Mm. level. But a lot of times it's the management who's dealing with the crises and you're just, you know, providing counsel. And so I just really, I really loved that experience. I was on the Great Plains board for five years. And of course, again, good timing, good time to be in Silicon Valley in 1997. The the dot-com boom was happening and there were a lot of new green shoots of entrepreneurship. And I was involved with a number of those companies. I Again, I had a pretty high profile because between being president of the Software Publishers Association and the head of, of worldwide developer relations for Apple, I knew a lot of software developers, right? I mean, that was that was one thing you could say is I pretty much knew everybody who was running a software company at the time. And so I started working on startups and as a I called it mentor capitalism. I would come in and I would be a mentor. And then in 99, I got recruited into venture capital because of course one of the big components of venture capital is the work you do helping to grow and build your companies as a as a board member 
And so I was recruited into venture capital in, in 99 and I've pretty much been there ever since. So this tour of duty is a long one. It's involved a few breaks and it's involved a few different companies, but the, the general thesis, the, the idea behind venture that you can be part of an entrepreneurial journey without being the one to carry it on your shoulders is I think, I think is what attracts a lot of people to venture capital. I think you've done it uh, with a lot of head and a lot of heart. So somebody I know, both of us know, um, I told him that, hey, Heidi is coming on Network Capital. And he just told me that my company, um, he runs an education company, and I think you know who I've talked about, Akshay. Yeah. He said that it wouldn't be what it is without Heidi. So you've had like a deep impact on uh, people and organizations, and you've uh, managed to build your social capital, your network capital, and of course, like your image in venture capital in a very beautiful way uh, oh, that leads. Thank you. How did you do that? And uh, does it in any shape or form connect with why Harvard Business School decided to run that case? What's the theme of it and so forth? Well, Harvard wrote the case before I, be right when I became a venture capitalist, literally the year I became a venture capitalist. So it really wasn't, I, it really, I think the Harvard, Harvard was attracted to writing the case more because of my roles in, in software and being the kind of the, you know, as they called it, the, the queen networker of, you know, the software industry. The maven, the, the maven. The maven, yeah, whatever yeah. the, you know, whatever the, whatever the wording was. But um, the, I mean, they're, they're two very different topics. The, the Harvard case was that there was a Harvard professor who really wanted to do a case about business networking. And she read an article about me in USA Today one time, it was Slow News Day, and they did this article about me being this, you know, networker of Silicon Valley. And she wanted a female protagonist. And so she reached out to me and, and, and ultimately we collaborated on the case. And the case was released, I think, in 2000. And it's still being taught 24 years later. She's updated it once or twice, I think. And I did a, a, an interview with her on the 20th anniversary of the case. But it's quite a popular case. And I think it's because a lot of Harvard cases are about, here's a business decision you have to make. Do you do A or do you do B? But hmm. my case is about here is a philosophy of life that you can employ. Does it resonate with you or not? And why? And, and, and I've, because I get asked about it so much, I've boiled it down to very different from networking to me. Because even networking hmm. still has sort of a slimy con connotation that you're using people. So I really talk about it in the following way. I like to think, that I have a relationship-driven life, that I lead mm. a relationship-driven life. And I think that some people lead transaction-driven lives. And to me, this idea of a relationship-driven life is that happiness in life, I fully believe, comes from meaningful work and meaningful relationships. And those things need to be built. And the cool thing about tech entrepreneurship is often you can get meaningful work and have meaningful relationships in the same place. Right. I think it's it's one of the elements of magic about entrepreneurship is, I mean, I'm still best friends with some of the people that I worked at TeamMaker with. And and that is is just we we again, going back to that expression, tour of duty, we feel like we went through a tour of duty together. We bonded together over a really important time in our individual lives when we accomplished something really important to us together. And that will bind us in a way uh, forever. And so I I. I think that my own personal philosophy is I'm in this life, I've got some skills and I'm just trying to make people happier in the world, a better place. Now that doesn't mean I'm the universal donor. That doesn't mean I'm going to do everything for everyone all the time, but it does mean that I, I look at life as it's not a zero sum game. It is something where I can contribute in ways. And if I can make other people do better. And it's not necessarily so that I make more money. I mean, hmm. sure, I am a venture capitalist, so I do try to help the companies <clears throat> we're invested in. But I also, you know, I, I, I spend a lot of time with young women in venture capital and young women entrepreneurs. Um, again, I spend time with not just women, but particularly, I think women are still underrepresented. And so I try to be helpful in that regard. I teach a fellowship program at Stanford. I just posted about it yesterday. We've now graduated over a hundred fellows and I've, I've 
worked very closely with some of them. I'm, I'm meeting with one of them tonight who graduated, I don't know, six years ago, but is having a work crisis and wants to talk to me about it. And so mm-hmm. I joke with the fellows that once you're in my program, you have a lifetime golden ticket for, you can have, you can call me anytime. <laughs> day or night. And you're, you know, you're going to get my, my help sometimes even telling you what you don't want to hear. But I just find a great, I find a great amount of joy in life to be able to do this. And, and again, I'll just say, I think I'm really fortunate that I've ended up going to work at places that value what I do and, mm. and that are willing to let me do it. I mean, one of the reasons why I'm at Threshold and, 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 you know, and, and remain there, even though I'm, I'm really no longer on the New Deal team, I'm not even investing anymore, which is what VCs do. I spend all my time mentoring the junior team, mentoring our portfolio companies and mentoring the students at Stanford and doing this podcast, which is another form of mentoring, right? And and all of that is supported by my partners at Threshold because they value what I do and they feel it is good for our community. And the ROI on it is not as clear as I put a dollar in here and I got $10 out you know, sometime in the future. And so I appreciate that when you work with people who the goal is not squeeze the last penny out of the entrepreneur. The goal is do the right thing to help entrepreneurs build great companies. And, and, and that is, that is what is valued at our firm. And so again, I'm just, I'm very fortunate that I, that I get to do this all day long. It's, um, you know, it's, it is kind of amusing that, you know, the joke is that they kind of probably, I shouldn't tell, say this, they probably don't have to pay me. I'd probably just work anyway. <laughs> I mean, I'm coming to Oxford on my vacation. <laughs> that tells you how much I like to teach, right? <laughs> and how lucky we are to, of course, learn from you uh, in Oxford. And this particular podcast will go about to about 200,000 plus people. So you are wow. essentially a mentor at scale. Uh, wow. But, you know, in the way you've navigated relationships in in, in your work and values, it's been a huge inspiration. Any final, uh, you know, word of advice to people who are just thinking about networks? And I want to give some context uh, to the question. Once you were giving a lecture at Stanford and somebody asked you, hey, time is limited. If I'm just going to a gas station, I just want to get the job done and move on. And you gave a beautiful answer. Now, I just want you to uh, add and elaborate how people perhaps women or uh, anyone else can look at scaling and becoming a network maven uh, through that. Well, I don't, I mean, I don't think it's about volume. It's not a volume game and it's not a, it's, it's, it's not a uh, walk in the room and try to meet the most important person. In fact, that's a sure way to fail because everyone else is also walking in the room and trying to meet the most important person. The way I look at it is, Hey, we're all people first and we're our job second. Right. And we all, everyone, everyone in the world has something to offer and, and something to give and, and some contribution to make. And so there is always the opportunity to help another person make another person's day better. There's, you know, like I'm that person, I always leave reviews when I buy products because it's important, you know, like on Etsy, right? If you, if you buy something from an artist, leave a review, post a picture, it, they put their heart and soul into that, right? I'm I'm always the person who is courteous to to service providers because because they're they're providing a service that I just use. I should respect them as a human being, and so and I think good opportunity comes from that. Now that doesn't mean that if you're just again if you we only have 24 hours in a day, so part of what right. you have to do is decide where am I going to commit my time? You know, and, and as I said earlier, I said about Stanford, I'm sure it's true about Oxford. One of the reasons I commit a lot of time and energy and resources to Stanford is because I don't know on any given year, who's going to be in my, in my fellowship program, but I know by the time I get to those people, they all had to have gotten into Stanford. They all have to be pursuing master's degrees at Stanford. And then I have 80 of them apply for 12 spots. The remain the 12 who get in, I know they're going to be amazing people that, that I think are gonna do wonderful things. And, and in, in many ways, my time spent on those people is probably more valuable than frankly, what I as a 66 year old today, am gonna do in my own life as an entrepreneur, right? Which is pretty much nothing. So, um, so I, I just think that if you go through life thinking, I 
Uh, everything is a relationship and nothing is a transaction. Every person is a person I might see again. Every person is a person who will remember what I've done for them. Um, that it's just a healthier way to live. And it does actually result in more success. And I do think it's amazing how many times people come back around again. You run into you run into people that you haven't talked to in a million years and you know like 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 mark um and and that it matters that what you do matters and even the little things matter and so to me that's just it's my my best day is not when some the market goes up or whatever my best day is someone who sends me an email and says i don't know if you know this but 5 years ago you made a connection for me and i you know and as a result i ended up in this career that I'm super happy with like that to me just brings me such joy that that again you know you can't pay I'm, I'm lucky because you can't pay the bills doing that all day long but I managed to find a career where actually it is part of my job to do things like that so I just consider myself super lucky interestingly I've heard this feedback that you know you're a giver first about both you and Mark Mark Mantresca separately so it's incredible. I can't tell you how many people have said this to me about Mark, like, you know, companies that I've invested and advised in and just people at Oxford and about you in different yeah. networks. So we can all um, uh, see how that goes. So yeah. we're going to attach the link of your case study, your podcast uh, and your incredible body of work. Um, is there anything I should have asked you that I didn't or any parting word of advice that you have before we open it up to others? Um, I'm going to guess you probably have a, a younger skewing audience than me, <laughs> since most of the world is younger skewing than me. So I'm going to close on, on something that, that I think is good advice for everyone. Um, uh, an actress named Shirley MacLaine came up with something called the 20, 40, 60 rule. And I've quoted it so often that now if you Google it, I think I come up ahead of Shirley. So with apologies, <laughs> um, she, it, it goes like this at 20, you're constantly worried about what other people think of you. At 40, you decide you're not going to give a damn what other people think of you. And at 60, you come to realize that no one was actually thinking of you. And so I, I love this expression because, because I think people spend a lot of time ruminating about their own mistakes, their own faux pas, their own whatevers. And people also have expectations that everyone else is thinking about you, including like your boss, which is probably not true. And so... I think that there is a response, there is liberation and responsibility in understanding that no one's thinking about you. On the one hand, when you make a mistake, figure out what you can do to write it, apologize for it and move on. Stop ruminating, stop worrying about it. Nobody really cares. Nobody really cares if you had a wrinkle in your suit or if you, you know, you know, nobody cares about a lot of what you worry about in life. And even the errors you make, usually people move on from them very quickly. But the flip side is nobody cares about your career except you. Nobody cares about whether you're getting paid enough. Nobody cares about whether your job is interesting to you. People do not. I tell this to my students all the time when they go into an employer and they start talking about what they're looking for in a career. And I said, hey, they're not looking to solve your problems. They're looking to solve their problems. Tell them right. how you can solve their problems. And so I just think that this, this idea that you are responsible for the journey that is your own life and you need to stop sitting around waiting for other people to do it for you. And um, the sooner everybody adapts to that, and, and also the flip side is, it's very liberating to think, and if you make a mistake, it's okay. Nobody's really going to, everybody's going to move on. Like, stop worrying about yourself. So I hope that gives everyone a, a liberating, um, a liber liberating idea. Very much so, Heidi. Thank you so much. I can't wait to meet you in Oxford, and uh, I really appreciate you taking well, time out. This for has us. been an absolute pleasure, and I just can't wait to be there. A few more months. I look forward to it. <laughs>